right, everyone. Welcome back to the land of Kem. I am your host and the author. My name is Jeffrey Drum. Thank you all so much for joining me again. All right, everyone. Welcome back. Now, today we dive into the highly anticipated next installment of this epic series, analyzing the mechanisms of operation driving the ancient Egyptian pyramid chemical engineering technology with part four, the final synthesis chamber of the Red Pyramid. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, thank you all so much for the support. I think that is it for today's intro. So without further ado, let's get right to it. All right, everyone, here we go with tonight's episode. Now to begin in part one, episode 156, the physics-based science of this ancient industrial scale chemical engineering technology was first introduced by explaining the chemical conversion of methane into hydrogen and carbon monoxide within the primary steam reformer. Followed by Part 2, Episode 157, Temperature and Pressure Capabilities of the Red Pyramid Reactors, presenting mathematical calculations demonstrating the capacity of these chambers to produce temperatures above 500 degrees Celsius and more than 40 atmospheres of pressure. And in Part 3, Missing Components, Physics and Chemistry of the Secondary Aeroformer. The mechanisms of operation within the second chamber were elucidated, along with a revelation regarding the critical missing component that was first discussed back in episode 89 that was anchored into the bilateral housings in the upper vault of the secondary aeroformer that were shown in last week's Sunday site visit. And if you haven't seen episode 158 yet, it is a must-watch so that you can understand the function of this missing component and exactly how it was integrated into the chemical manufacturing sequence. I'll put links in the video description below, and all of these episodes have now been added to the Red Pyramid playlist. So thus far, we have converted methane into hydrogen and carbon monoxide in the primary steam reformer, then added air to introduce nitrogen and transform the carbon monoxide into water-soluble carbon dioxide, which was then removed from the system, leaving hydrogen and nitrogen the final reactants that were pumped into the final synthesis chamber according to the following sequence. And if you are new to the channel, please go back and watch parts 1, 2, and 3 so that you can get caught up to where we are today. So now, let's turn on this ancient chemical engineering machine and run the process. So now we have the nitrogen and hydrogen in the upper vault of the final synthesis chamber where the final conversion will create gaseous ammonia. Ammonia gas is highly soluble in water, meaning that it will easily dissolve into water even at room temperature and pressure. But first, let's examine the reaction between hydrogen and nitrogen that creates the ammonia gas. And whether you are an OG subscriber since day one or a new viewer, everything that is presented here on this channel is cumulative, with episode after episode building the foundations for subsequent research, planning and laying groundwork for videos like this when all of the pieces finally come together and the full puzzle picture is unveiled. So remember back in episode 108, Electric Fields Inside the Great Pyramid when the concept of electric field concentration within the Egyptian pyramids was first introduced with this study, revealing that the Great Pyramid of Giza can focus electromagnetic energy, entitled Electromagnetic Properties of the Great Pyramid, First Multipole Resonances and Energy Concentration, which experimentally demonstrated that the Great Pyramid was designed to concentrate electric fields in the area surrounding the sulfur furnace an acoustic catalyst antechamber, 
and in episode 120, the Great Pyramid Ultrasound Catalyst, I explained how these concentrated electric fields were integrated into the operation of the Great Pyramid as a catalyst for the sonochemical reaction that created a dilute solution of sulfuric acid. To reiterate, the electric fields induced the inverse piezoelectric effect within the red granite components of the Great Pyramid to catalyze a series of chemical reactions producing the final sulfuric acid product. And I'll be coming back to the Great Pyramid later in this series once we finish with the red and bent pyramids of Dashur. And I propose that the same properties and capability of concentrating electric fields around the primary reaction chambers also applies to the reactors of the red pyramid. And in episode 117, Electric Field Chemistry, I presented several research papers detailing the roles of electric fields in facilitating and catalyzing chemical reactions. This one here, entitled Electric Field Mediated Chemistry, Uncovering and Exploiting the Potential of Oriented Electric Fields to Exert Chemical Catalysis and Reaction Control. Best summarized in this article, entitled Electric Field Intensified Chemical Processes and Reaction Chemistry, stating here, electric fields represent an important resource that can be utilized for process intensification in the chemical industry. Utilization of electric fields provides an efficient and cost-effective way for intensified chemical processing and reaction chemistry. But, lo and behold, in episode 152, electric field facilitated low temperature ammonia synthesis. It was experimentally proven that electric fields can be utilized in producing ammonia gas at low temperatures in multiple studies. The first one here, on the elucidation of the role of electric fields on low temperature ammonia synthesis using isotopes. Stating here, we have found that an electric field brings high yield on low temperature catalytic ammonia synthesis over a cesium, ruthenium, strontium, zirconium oxide catalyst. And here is a close-up of the process model illustrating the induced electric fields here over this strontium zirconium oxide catalyst that drives the low temperature creation of the final ammonia molecule. And again, here in this paper, entitled Electromagnetic Field Enables Ammonia Synthesis at Low Temperatures, stating here that using commercial iron-based catalysts, a university team devised an electromagnetic field-assisted Haber-Bosch method for ammonia synthesis under moderate circumstances. With the electromagnetic field aid, the onset temperature is 100 degrees Celsius, which is obviously lower than the onset temperature without EMF support of 300 degrees Celsius. Now, let me read that again one more time just to emphasize this point as it will be relevant again in just a moment. They were able to synthesize ammonia under moderate circumstances with an onset temperature of 100 degrees Celsius, significantly lower than the conventional onset temperature of 300 degrees Celsius. This new EMF-assisted Haber-Bosch approach boosts ammonia yield five times while decreasing energy usage. With this model here, demonstrating the same process over a standard iron catalyst. And of course, the red pyramid is equipped with all of these catalyst materials as proven by the chemical analysis, which has been presented and discussed extensively here on the channel regarding the samples that were collected from the red staining throughout the system, which contain all of the catalyst materials that have been utilized in every stage of the reaction sequence thus far, starting with nickel in the primary steam reformer, iron, the primary catalyst used in the Haber-Bosch synthesis process, and the novel strontium zirconium catalyst that was implemented in the electric field catalyzed low temperature ammonia synthesis experiments. And in episode 142, lightning and fertilizer, I explain how the red pyramid was designed to capture lightning in a bottle. By building a structure that could internalize and contain 
the same chemical reaction that occurs in the atmosphere during lightning strikes that creates water-soluble nitrogen fertilizers, literally making fertilizer out of air, which is exactly what we have been doing in the last two chambers of the Red Pyramid, where air is introduced into the system to provide nitrogen that is then converted via electric fields into ammonia gas within the final synthesis chamber. But instead of using steel pressure chambers, like the one you can see here, a historical example of the final synthesis chamber utilized in the modern Haber process, they implemented chambers like this. Massive limestone structures embedded within the body of pyramids that were intentionally engineered to contain the immense pressure generated while the system was operational. So now, here we are inside of the final synthesis chamber. But what you can see here is not the original configuration of the chamber. This entire pit was excavated and the floor was removed in search for hidden passages, chambers, and pharaonic treasures, of which they found absolutely nothing. And you can see here the level of the floor, the bottom of the chamber that would have originally looked something like this. And I propose that there was something in this chamber that must have provided the impetus and justification for the intensely laborious removal of all of this stone. They saw something in this chamber that gave them a reason to dig further. The ammonia solution extraction shaft. And they began destroying the floor as they followed the shaft further down into the structure, but after expending an enormous amount of work, they found nothing, the project was abandoned, and the pit is what we have left of that effort today. So now that we have established the location for the extraction shaft, let's turn this thing on and make some ammonia. And here's where we left off in last week's episode with the hydrogen and nitrogen in the upper vault of the final synthesis chamber. Next. The pump shaft is reactivated, compressing the remaining water in the northern pump shaft into the upper reaction vault, gradually increasing the temperature and pressure until the pump has reached the resting block at the bottom of the northern pump shaft. And for some of you that were paying close attention to last week's Sunday site visit, alarm bells and light bulbs should be going off right now as I was extremely intentional to spend a good amount of time documenting and explaining the engineering behind the configuration of the resting block component at the bottom of the northern pump shaft. This mechanism of raising the water into the final synthesis chamber initiates the reaction between the nitrogen and hydrogen in the presence of electric fields and catalyst material coating the chamber that generates ammonia gas. And remember from these research papers that this can occur at initial temperatures as low as 100 degrees Celsius, which is actually ideal in this case, where lower temperatures and higher pressures are more suitable for the production of the aqueous ammonia solution. Recall from episode 156 that the major difference between the modern Haber process and this ancient chemical engineering system is that today we make liquid ammonia ammonia gas cooled into a liquid, whereas the ancient technology created aqueous ammonia solutions, gas dissolved into water. And as I stated before, ammonia gas is highly soluble in water, and it will easily dissolve into the water in the chamber, even under ambient temperatures and pressures. So the gas will begin to dissolve into the water. And this removal of the ammonia gas by dissolution prevents the reverse reaction of ammonia breakdown and also facilitates the forward momentum of the remaining hydrogen and nitrogen reaction that produces more ammonia gas. So as the process continues, more ammonia dissolves into the water under pressure, creating the final product aqueous ammonia solution, as you can see here. Then the extraction shaft is opened and the product can be quickly removed from the system, 
preventing any reaction between the product solution and the limestone reactor walls. Generally speaking, any reaction between a dilute aqueous ammonia solution and the limestone would be negligible, if anything at all, especially at low temperatures as described and if it is removed immediately as shown here. Now keep in mind, these slides are simply demonstrating the mechanisms of operation in each chamber individually. The whole system will be put together as a continuous manufacturing sequence in an upcoming video. So now, let's see the chambers in operation from start to finish. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, the function of the final synthesis chamber and the electric field catalyzed low temperature aqueous ammonia synthesis reaction. But that's not all. We still need to examine the function of the northern pump shaft, including some mathematical calculations and the external reservoir. And last but not least, the grand finale, lightning, electric fields, and catalysts. So if you haven't already, please subscribe as I will be doing this exact same process with all of the major pyramids, including the Bent Pyramid, the Great Pyramid, the Central Pyramid, and the Final Pyramid later on in this series, involving a meticulous examination of the mechanisms of operation driving the ancient Egyptian pyramid chemical engineering technology. All right, everyone, I hope you're enjoying the video. And if you are interested, in the ancient technology of a lost civilization utilizing physics and chemistry and the function of the Egyptian pyramids and other ancient structures from across the world, please remember to subscribe to The Land of Chem here on YouTube so you don't miss out on the new episodes that premiere twice per week. If you want to help support the channel, check out thelandofchem.com. You can pick up a copy of the book or grab some merch. Link in the video description below. And if you want to get access to exclusive research videos, check out the Land of Chem members-only channel now up to 22 absolutely massive research episodes that also feature some unreleased expedition footage. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, thank you all so much for the support. Now, back to the video. All right, everyone, that is it for today's video. This was episode 159, the final synthesis chamber of the Red Pyramid. I really hope you enjoyed today's video. And in the next episode of the series, Sunday Site Visit 104. This is an episode you do not want to miss. So if you haven't already, Please subscribe to The Land of Chem here on YouTube and remember to click that little notification bell so you don't miss out on the new episodes that premiere twice per week. Please like, comment, share, and stay tuned. If you want to help support the channel and get access to exclusive research content, check out The Land of Chem members only channel and thelandofchem.com if you want to pick up a copy of the book. Links in the video description below. If you want to follow me on Instagram or on X, my handle is at The Land of Chem. Also, don't forget, after you finish watching this video, Please go subscribe to our three other channels, Ancient Odysseys, Let's Go with Lex and G, and the best channel on YouTube, Egyptian Trash Cats, for all you cat lovers out there. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, thank you all so much for the support. I think that is it for today's episode, so I will see you. Next time. Yo, are you still watching this? Please subscribe to The Land of Chem here on YouTube and click that little notification button. New videos coming out every single week. And check out this other episode. Come on, do it.
Do it now.